So next up, we're going to actually bring up a panel of end users. Ron Miller has been kind enough from TechCrunch to moderate this panel of amazing end users. Coming up on stage, we're going to have Susanna Brown from American Airlines, Justin Stone from Liberty Mutual, Christopher Tertina from Comcast, Ines Ildrum from Boeing, Andy Rosequist from Zipcar, and Andrea Yeager from Allianz to talk a little bit about their journey. So come on up on stage. Excellent song. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nice. Okay, Even better. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that kind of music. <laughs> Rocking out. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ron Miller. I'm from TechCrunch. And I'm up here with this group of Cloud Foundry users to figure out why they chose Cloud Foundry. But we're going to be looking at this in the broader context of digital transformation inside large organizations and how Cloud Foundry itself can be a catalyst for change inside your companies. And you know, I think it's more than hyperbole to say that um, the technology choices that you're going to make today could have a big impact on your future success as companies. So I'm going to ask these people who are working inside these large organizations and really pushing their companies to uh, a more modern context why they've chosen the software and processes they've chosen to make that happen. So to get us started, I'm just going to, because there's a lot of us and I want you to be able to know who's talking, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves briefly and then we'll get into the questions. And you can start, Chris. So I'm Chris Tretina, uh, Director of Software Development at Comcast. Uh, we've been using Cloud Foundry for about four and a half years. Susanna Brown with American Airlines. We became a gold member of the community last year. And I manage operations technology, which are a lot of the systems that keep our planes up in the air. Ines Yildrum, um, the uh, Digital Transformation Environment Program Director. Uh, we actually help her keep the airplanes <laughs> going. Um, so my and job is- they sell them airplanes too. So. Exactly. Yeah. And we just sold a few last week. Um, so my job is to create the modern development environment globally so we can produce the, the software that's necessary or the other products that will transform how we serve and produce better products and how we serve our customers. I'm Andy Rosequist uh, from Zipcar, so I lead our operations platform and security teams. Um, and so what we use a platform based on Cloud Foundry to help us deliver the future of mobility um, and to keep innovating. Andrea Jäger with Allianz in Germany. I'm head of department um, on the operations side. And uh, we started to use Cloud Foundry a couple of years ago, um, also in an effort to um, make the user or the customer experience um, an excellent one. I'm Justin Stone, director in the cloud and security enablement team at Liberty Mutual. Um, we're leveraging Cloud Foundry to help solve all sorts of problems for our net new applications as well as our uh, application modernizations, tackling any of those challenges from how we deliver the software but also how we make it more secure. All right, so um, I think that when I was thinking about this and how we talk about um, Cloud Foundry, and the organizational change that it drives. It's like, what is the ultimate purpose of this? And it's, it's, to, it's to make a better experience for your customers. And how do you produce uh, services and products that make a better experience? So when you guys look at using Cloud Foundry, how, do you, how have you found that that helps improve your ultimate customer experience? I'll, I'll take this one first, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so probably Susanna and I are very popular at parties. People are always happy to provide their feedback about uh, their cable service and their airline. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Comcast has been on. By the way, I want to talk to you backstage. <laughs> uh, Comcast has been on about a two-year journey uh, where we introduced uh, the Net Promoter Score system. Uh, we started out, I think, a negative 15, something like that. Um, <laughs> And I'm pleased to say that two years later, here we are now at uh, 0 0.8, so at least we've hit neutrality. Uh, I would like to say a lot of that has to do with our Cloud Foundry uh, implementation. Uh, prior to, one of the strongest reasons for customer dissatisfaction was the availability of our applications. 
Uh, with Cloud Foundry, we've uh, introduced about 60% improvement in our availability, which has dramatically improved the ability of our customers to interface with self-service and our frontline employees to work with our customers. So for us, it's really been all about speed of delivery. So in addition to just not just getting customer experience improvements, but also consistency in the customer experience, depending on the channel in which our customers choose to engage with us. So we're wanting to make sure that if you're checking in at the kiosk or on your mobile device, that the options and the, and the experience is consistent. And we were finding that whenever we had a major request from our from our business units, um, the change, because it was it cut across multiple channels of delivery, could potentially take up to 12 months. By having that experience now consolidated and using Cloud Foundry, and ours is based more on the IBM Cloud, um, we've really been able to reduce our delivery of major projects to, I know this is still long, but two months. And for us, that's incredible. So. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, I think at Boeing, um, one of the things that we're doing, uh, I'll take a, a little bit of a history lesson first. So user experience dates uh, uh, tens of years ago when <laughs> we're building aircraft, um, either in defense on, on the ones that we fly on. Um, it's extremely important that all your dashboards and everything is very well designed for the user. So the user-centric design have been uh, at the heart of the, the company, but recently I think what we've seen is in our systems, the software systems, we haven't um, really focused as much. Uh, we've been on par with the industry, but that's just not good enough. So we've leveraged Pivotal Cloud Foundry as a part of um, our build, measure, learn cycle and be able to improve that build, measure, learn and iterate. Uh, we did start with a couple of months instead of a couple of years, and now we're able to iterate on a daily basis on our designs. You know, with that, um, for us, it, I think uh, the difference has also been not just the technology that enables all of that, but the process changes um, within uh, the entire life cycle of the products. You are so much more directly engaged with your customer, and you get constant feedback. Um, th that's something that we've really been focusing on to really talk to them and find out how they like the product. Yeah, I would echo that as well. I think the, the customer feedback loop is, is dramatically improved. Um, the test quality, everything that's going out the door is higher quality. Uh, we have less issues in production than we've ever had before in this platform. Helps to have a really strong pipeline and platform team to support it for us. Um, and we have some of those folks here today. Um, but that helps tremendously in regards to the confidence that the business has when you're making commitments to deliver things. Uh, there's never that doubt anymore that you're going to get it out the door. So I would even like, I would talk about it as a two uh, phase cycle of engagement. So one of Zipcar's core values has been obsessed about the member experience. And a couple of years ago, we said, let's, uh, let's take that and let's also focus that internally and obsess about the engineer experience and making it like by creating better engagement for our engineers and better ability to um, see the immediate results of their actions. Our engineers are able to engage directly with our customers, and that's able to uh, let us really cut those feedback uh, cycle times very, very down. Yeah, well said. So, and, you know, what I'm hearing is that using Cloud Foundry caused an improvement in, in internal processes that led to, um, you know, improved customer experience. Um, and that, but what I'm, what I'm curious about is how Cloud Foundry contributed to that internal process improvement that kind of feeds out back to the customer. So how And I can take that. That's pretty good. And I've been very vocal being in a Cloud Foundry summit saying that I really don't want to think about infrastructure. Uh, what what uh, Cloud Foundry and especially the Pivotal distribution helped us do is made it so f obvious that the infrastructure wasn't the problem. It was all the processes around it. So being able to install in a couple of hours, and I think you were doing it every 30 minutes or something, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so we installed the first instance in four hours and stood it up, and then we're like, okay, now what? Um, so the whole process and the ecosystem really got exposed, so we were able to focus on the things that we really needed to change that grew over the last 100 years, rather than, you know, is really the install going to work? But it also facilitates the sharing, right? That, communi that sense of community and, and sharing of knowledge. And uh, I think that there is a lot of excitement around that as well, of developers being able to educate others, de uh, developers on those best practices. So 
Yes. I think it's, don't think about infrastructure, but also creating community knowledge. Yeah, the collaboration piece has yes. been a huge one for us. You know, because of the speed, mm -hmm. you have to actually talk to each other. If you're going to get something out there fast, it's true. Imagine you know, that. Now all of a sudden you have to talk to your security guy. They have to be part of the team. Um, your architects, everybody, ops, dev, everybody's around the same table um, to get this stuff uh, out the door as, as quickly as the, the technology allows you to do it. We've definitely made some changes in how our teams are organized to be more fully capable from, from soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really helped uh, in our partnerships with our application teams solve their problems faster. Instead of needing to call five different siloed organizations, they can get stuff done in the room, fully empowered, and not having to call management like they had to in the past to escalate. Um, and that catches on really, really fast. Yep. And one team sees another team do that, and they want to ask you know, how and why they can take advantage of that. And Cloud Foundry is at the core of a lot of that, but it's how they're working together that is really what's making them successful as well. Yeah, I, I think it's both the collaboration and the infrastructure, as, as Susanna and Ennis mentioned. Uh, on, on our side, uh, late last year, we were tasked with building a mobile virtual agent for our customers. Uh, using AI and ML built on top of Cloud Foundry. Uh, Cloud Foundry was really the secret ingredient that allowed us to build it in about eight weeks uh, on top of uh, hybrid cloud, private, and Amazon. Uh, and with such close-knit coll collaboration uh, built on the community of folks that we had assembled, uh, we were able to pull that off. And uh, we're already getting ready to roll out to new channels. Uh, so Cloud Foundry has really enabled us uh, to make what seemed to be impossible in the past suddenly possible. So, so it sounds like it's improving communication across the organization. And typically with a technology kind of driven um, you know, solution, the, you know, the, the, the IT people kind of control that and then it doesn't, the business process people feel like, okay, this is just something that's being pushed on us. It sounds like from what you guys are saying that there's a lot more collaborative process across the organization, so I'm curious, how does using Cloud Foundry really um, drive that kind of collaborative process so that you're getting people who normally wouldn't be involved in a software process involved earlier in the process? And it's not just something, oh, here's this piece of software that they created for me and now I have to use it. When you can see directly the impact of the conversation you're having. So if you're uh, a business user and you're trying to um, do something in, in the internally developed software and it's not working, and when it's fixed an hour later, you have a reason to keep coming back and talking. Mm -hmm. Instead of it being, oh, it's gonna take us a year to fix it, so everyone just lives with the pain, no one engages, and, and there's a cycle of distrust. By having that speed of execution, uh, there's an incentive to talk to each other because you can actually see results of that conversation go live and impact directly. Very fast. And I'll build on that. Um, I think Subo also mentioned Part of what we did is um, when you go start going this fast, you start running into a lot of the internal uh, politics and, and bureaucracy. And what we've done to overcome that is we've, um, since we made technology less relevant to the discussion because it's working, uh, we started talking about what's the outcome. So we brought in the business up front and, and actually spent as much time as necessary to understand what are we trying to accomplish. Uh, so we brought them as product managers from the business units, and then we brought in designers and made that a bona fide one of the key skills in the team that focused on the users, and then we had really the, the right technology in the team to be able to work and build that balanced team. So, and they work together and they you know, eat breakfast together, and, and they just really talk to each other, and as yeah. a result, they deliver daily. You know, I think IT, um is now part of the business discussion. They're pushing the business to describe what their customer-centric vision is mm -hmm. so that IT can enable the transformation, the digital transformation. But if you don't have the picture clear from a business perspective, you know, you can digitize a little bit here and there, but that's not gonna really make the difference. I think there was a failure you know, in the 90s when you had enterprise software that was kind of pushed on mm -hmm. to the people inside the organization. It was a terrible user experience. The, mm -hmm. the change cycles were long, as you, you pointed yeah. out, Andy. And um, the, the, uh, the people were just like, well, this is what we have to use. But people are getting better consumer experiences, and they want that at work, too. So how does, how does Cloud Foundry push that 
better consumer-like experience, both to internal users and external you know, customers. I think one of the biggest things that's, that's happening with, within Comcast and almost going back to some of the discussion and previously is that that open source mentality and collaboration that comes with Cloud Foundry uh, has really led us to change dramatically the way that we engage with our business partners. Uh, for the first time, we've set up a portfolio-based domain uh, that is now allowing us and, and enabling our business partners uh, to prioritize their work for us and make the kind of trade-offs that in the past would have come to IT to make. Um, and I think Cloud Foundry is a key enabler for that insofar as it, it's almost removed technology from the discussion, I, I believe, as Ennis was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're now able to deploy with such frequency that our business partners can immediately see that impact. Uh, and it's no longer a matter of, of having to wait you know, six, nine, 12 months to see what they want to see. Uh, that, that's really changed the game for us. I think one of the things we're seeing is our, our startup time to get something out the door to a customer to get feedback on um, is much more rapid even for a new developer coming in the door today that doesn't know the system whatsoever. Uh, we've proven that we can get them delivering code into production for feedback inside of a day. And not that long ago, weeks ago, that, that took up to 23 days, like best case scenario, uh, on Cloud Foundry, right? So we had to do a lot of work to tie it back to all of our enterprise class systems that we had to abide by that made it a better experience for that application to interact with every other application we have. Because at the end of the day, it's a hybrid, right? We can't run everything on Cloud Foundry. I haven't been able to yet. Uh, it make life a little bit easier, I would assume. Um, but you know that, that's been a big win for us. So any developer can come in and leverage the tool set to get code out the door fast without having to learn all of the, the history of the company and the intricacies to mm -hmm. make that happen, which has been really powerful. You guys are all dealing with legacy systems being large um, and, and oh, yeah. <laughs> companies that have been around for a long time. Um, so you know, that's an interesting uh, point that you bring up, that you, know, you can't put everything on Cloud Foundry. And the Cloud Foundry applications probably have to interact with existing legacy tools. I mean, especially, I mean, you probably have all kinds of things at an airline. And, yeah. and I mean, all of you. Um, yeah. So how does working with Cloud Foundry, how does that work and play nicely with you know, existing systems inside the organization? Well, I think it takes a, a bit of architecture. I don't know if you guys like or not, but uh, we started with no architecture uh, when we first started and said, we're gonna take it all out, all processes, all architecture, and we're finding out that actually a good bit of architecture works really well. So one of the things we're doing right now is um, we've announced last year in the Paris Air Show that we're, we have an analytics platform so that's a customer facing um, um, data platform that um, it's really helping our customers uh, be able to leverage their data and be able to do better um, service to you. Um, so it's the airlines or, or um, other services companies. So our analytics platform is using Cloud Foundry. So being able to release capabilities um, into that uh, more frequently actually helps. And what we're doing is we're just following some methodology like the, the Strangler method is one of them. So you build around the system and, and you kind of encapsulate the old systems um, and be able to just create that little interface and the services and API. Just, just a little bit of architecture goes a long ways to be able to leverage the old systems. Yeah, str Strangler pattern is, is really key, Ennis, absolutely. You know, at its core, much of Comcast business still runs off of a 25 to 30 year old mainframe system uh, that we've built a whole number, whole slew of microservices now on top of using Cloud Foundry. That is really what's enabling us now for the first time to look at a next gen billing system uh, that when we roll out will completely change the way that we engage with our customers, the kind of services that we offer. Um, and it's really the level of standardization now that's happening across the teams throughout the organization uh, is for the first time what's making that a possibility. Yeah, one of the things that's been very empowering for our teams is we just ask our developers where their pain points are and if that's an area they think is worthwhile to take on a challenge to make their life easier. So if, if there's a lot of break fixes that are going on there, if it's a code they're changing much more rapidly, the business needs changed. Uh, that's where we started, and that's what kind of built the momentum because the developers wanted to fix it, and we gave them a the leeway to go tackle that. Um, so it wasn't always necessarily a business problem that, that we went after first. It was time that the developers spent. Now their time's freed up, and they can go tackle other things. But how do they get back to tying into like your legacy billing system and your legacy 
um, or, you know, uh, uh, whatever they are, you know, whatever you're using, your, your ERP systems and all of that. How do they get? How do they get back to it? How do they tie into that? <laughs> so if they're if they're using Cloud Foundry to build, you know, this modern kind of architecture uh, and application there's still a need to be able to tie back into those, those existing backend systems. And I'm wondering how easy is it to, to do that when you have these systems as the Chris was saying, like a 25, 30 year old it, mainframe. It, it, it wasn't easy, right? And it's an <laughs> yeah. ongoing challenge that we yeah. deal with every day, yeah. Well, and some of them, I mean, we're going through the process of looking at those legacy systems to try and figure out which ones are portable, which ones can be moved into the new world and, and which ones we have to just I don't know what you called it, put them in a bubble Sprangler. or whatever. Yeah. 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 Them. Yeah. And it's not as bad as Cement. it sounds actually. Right. <laughs> you wrap it around it, not to Gently. choke it. Right. <laughs> right. But it lets you carve out the yeah, other Yeah, just thing. carve out. <laughs> yeah. But the goal Please has to it. be to figure out a way to, yes. to get yes. it all. So our mainframe system is about 50 years old. Wow. A little older than Comcast's. Um, you win. You win. And we're, and we're, <laughs> and we're still win. bringing two airlines together. So we're, we're more, our focus has been much more on the customer-facing applications so far. And my organization, that's in part why I'm so excited to be here um, at this conference, is really learning um, all of the benefits of CF, and we're hoping that we can uh, take experiences from other big companies to accelerate our journey and once again leverage the community and the knowledge of the community to make, make that happen. So I've already, I have to make notes on a bunch of different <laughs> things we've already talked about. <laughs> well, given another example I just thought about, um, this might be intriguing to some. So we have a lot of Fortran applications because it's an engineering company, oh. airplane design. <laughs> is on Fortran, it's still pretty cool. Um, and do you have developers that can actually program in that? Absolute engineers, <laughs> yeah. uh, and not software engineers, but uh, anyways, other kinds of engineers. Yeah. Um, or so over these, 50, no, no. Right? Yeah, so the, these, uh, uh, we, were, we had this system on airplane performance navigation, so when we go into a sales process, we use it to demonstrate the range of our airplane capabilities, and, and one of the critical systems in that was written on Fortran on HP UX, I think, or some other, not mainframe. We're getting rid of mainframe in a couple of months. Um, so the team actually took that and, and put it in a container and slapped it into Cloud Foundry uh, very quickly, and what that enabled is, is that that bottleneck system became now an enabler that you can scale out using the cloud and on demand, and the, the systems that took several hours to process, now it takes a couple of minutes, and they're gonna take it a couple of seconds. So they can run many, like thousands of simulations by scaling out, leveraging the platform. Yeah, I mean, time is flying here. I wanted to ask um, the culture question. Um, Abby and Subu were talking about this earlier, and um, Subu was particularly articulate about the, uh, the cultural issues and trying to get uh, you know, change done across an organization. You talked about fear versus freedom and, and those kinds of issues. And I'm wondering, when you look at Cloud Foundry in this context of a broader organizational shift and change um, to a more modern, you know, driven company, customer-driven company that can move quickly and hopefully not break things, um, <laughs> that uh, uh, how, how does that uh, cultural question come into play for you guys when, when it comes to pushing the change out from you, know, you guys as change agents? I think, you know, it's the, the most important piece of that, um, in my mind, is for the entire organization to realize it's not an IT change. It's not just the technology change, but the change and um, the transformation has to happen within the entire company. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the senior management uh, folks have to be on board. You have to get your employees um, to realize the potential and the exciting opportunities that come with this. Um, but then it's also really all of the different organizational units, including an HR, a finance, everybody has to really buy into this to make it successful um, because otherwise it's just going to be one, one small little piece and it's not going to be as transformational as, as what right. it can be. And, and when you have, um, it, even when you have the buy-in, however, the reality <laughs> is that there is fear. Right. And, and people resist yep. that, that change. So one of the things that we started doing about a year ago 
within my group was we did automation challenges. So going to what Justin was saying in terms of finding the areas that could be of the biggest help to our developers, letting them come to an automation challenge once every quarter to bring their problems and then have the teams swarm around it. You know, sometimes something would work, but sometimes it would fail. And we would just report out on, you know, what the outcome of that challenge was. It, because it really becomes a behavioral change, mm -hmm. right? Of having, of being okay with that failure and mm -hmm. accepting it. And hopefully through that, reducing the fear of change. Yeah, it's, it's going from a culture of fear to a culture of trust. Mm -hmm. And it's about building trust across um, the organization. It's not just about uh, getting rid of the fear of change, but it's about trusting that other people will do what, there's, what they need to do in order to make it successful. Mm -hmm. And that comes, and for us, it's about tying it back to what we care about, which is you know, the people that are driving our cars. And that's what we care about. And how can we make their lives better? Um, and that lets us get through a lot of the sort of fear and distrust that may exist. You know, large organizations are set up to protect themselves from change, right? They're, 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 there are structures in place. There are lawyers. There are you know HR teams. There are there are management layers that work to protect the organization as a structure. And I wonder how you break through all of that. Uh, you know, with, with all of the advantages that this system is offering you, it's, they're obvious. But they still, when you have a large company with a lot of people and a lot of management, and I'm sure a lot of lawyers, how do you? Uh, <laughs> No offense to the lawyers, but um, you know how do you how do you uh, you know get the organization shifting in a new direction with all of that kind of working you know against that process? And I'll I'll share our approach. I think we have two things we've done. One, change is hard. First of all, we all need to accept that we need to change. I think demonstrating by example is very good, and helping people to get through that change is is extremely. Um, Important. So what we've done is we've created this this program that that I'm leading, that is uh, chartered to create these new environments where there are new norms, and when those I consider them like the Formula One racers, so we're the pit crew. So when the development is, team is trying to release code and and do all the things that they need to do, mm -hmm. they run into issues. So as a result, the pit crew goes back and says, so what happened here? Mm -hmm. Is it a legal problem or is it a process problem? Is it really a problem? And then we get through and then systematically transform the processes, the HR practices, the financial practices, all of that at the corporate level so we can do this as a normal day-to-day -day life. So that's the investment that we've made as a part of our second century enterprise systems to make that business change. While uh, Abby and Subu were, were speaking earlier, I was reflecting back on, on our own transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the change from a, a competitive to a collaborative culture. Uh, and I think a lot of that takes great leadership. Uh, we were fortunate on our side with, with folks like Mike Crisofoli and Greg Otto and Paul Roach, uh, who really came up with the right shared goals across the organization. Uh, we subscribe to a process called Four Disciplines of Execution, or 4DX, very popular now in the industry. Uh, and it was amazing how when we rolled that out to the teams, uh, suddenly, you know, an outage in my system, uh, no longer were folks kind of going, ah, that's, that's his problem. Uh, now everyone was jumping on board to make sure that it, that it was resolved. Uh, that, that culture shift was huge. That's, what, that's one of the things I meant when I said earlier, the entire organization has to be on board. You have to change your incentive systems. You have to, you know, change all of that to, to make it happen. But just to give an example of um, how, how we've been moving this change forward um, at Allianz, um, we created a, just a, a couple of small teams, you know, and um, had them using the new processes, showing the success of their um, small project and then and growing it from there. So we created training centers in separate locations um, to provide them with the environment that they needed um, to get the job done. And, um, and now we're beginning to bring that back into the larger organization. It's a process, it's yeah. a journey, you know. So, you know, we talk a lot about the successes that we build on and those are important to maintain that, uh, that momentum of the team, that excitement. Um, but we're also, I mean, we struggle with it at times, but we're trying to celebrate some of the failures that, you know, we talk about it, but you gotta, you know, kind of walk that talk a little bit with your team. And, 
um, when they try something and they learn, but you know, we're not using it. Uh, we still try to celebrate that a little bit. We put it in the ARC newsletter that goes out, like here's what we tried, it didn't go well, but right. you know what we did learn? We're not gonna do that, and we're gonna go tackle this other thing next, and we're learning that in days and weeks instead of weeks and months, yeah. um, and, and the business sees that, and they see that the investment to that failure isn't as significant as it would have been just a right. year or two ago. And so you have to really important. embrace the people that are willing to take those first steps, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because Without a doubt. they're really very courageous in what they're doing. And I heard a presentation in one of the government present, uh, groups yesterday. I loved what the guys were saying. They called it the coalition of the willing, <laughs> right? That they were putting themselves out there to, to make change happen. And, and that's hard. Well, we are at the end of our time, I'm afraid. Uh, this was a really great discussion. I only got to scratch the surface of what I wanted to talk to these people about. but uh, He has three pages of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to continue backstage. I'm keeping them until tomorrow. <laughs> but why don't you give them a round of applause? <laughs>